back everyone. So for this uh, last session of the day, very happy to have uh, Santos who will tell us about joint work with Intat on the convergence of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so this talk is about the sampling problem, which is uh, to generate a random point according to a, a non-negative integrable function. The density is proportional to that. Uh, so this has many uh, guises and special cases of interest, such as sampling from a convex body or some density restricted to a body, uh, and so on. Uh, yes, so one case that uh, may be prototypical to keep in mind is sampling a point from the uniform distribution on a given convex set. This itself already has two settings in which you could talk about it. One, the set is given by an oracle, so you can ask in or out, and you have a starting point in the set. Alternatively, it's explicit, it's just a polytope. This talk will mostly focus on the second setting. I'll just uh, point out how uh, it compares with the general setting, whatever we mentioned. Okay, um, why do we want to work on this problem? Uh, uh, it seems to really address some questions in optimization, even though it's uh, not for, let's say, the most uh, practical situations, uh, the fastest algorithm. Um, but given just these two settings, you know, what's the, what are the limits and uh, uh, abilities of this, these mo computational models? And then you can compute a bunch of things which we don't know how to do by other means, such as computing the volume, the center of gravity, the covariance of a distribution, and so on. You can do some certain extensions of optimization by this that we don't know how to do by other means, such as robust or noisy, when there's noise in the, in, in, in the data or in the objective, stochastic optimization, exploring models for, for in machine learning. And then I guess perhaps most uh, most of all, it provides a different angle on how to think about convexity and so on. Indeed, uh, to just <laughs> take one more slide to do this, um, there is this general intuition that a problem is easy if it is written as a convex problem, at least it's polynomial time, up to some approximation uh, and randomization. And maybe the other way around is true in some sense. I don't know what sense. But uh, here is a sequence of uh, convex problems. Uh, Right, that's solving linear systems, linear programming, convex programming, and sampling log concave functions. And uh, you know the complexities of these. For convenience, I'm taking m equals order n in the a part here. So that's matrix multiplication time. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, n to the 2.5 because of uh, interior point, but square root n you know, with this least said foot barrier. And then uh, using cutting planes, you get n cubed for general convex programming. And sampling is n to the 6. It's really hidden in here is n to the 4 steps, but each step takes n squared. But that's, that's this general picture. Now you might ask, where is this going? f is convex. You know, maybe, maybe we can do everything in n squared. And then even if you wanted to do solve linear systems, you could just sample. So okay. that's the. Uh, this might not happen this year, yeah. OK, so sampling polytopes, let's, this is the problem we'll stick to. Uh, M constraints, N variables, you want to pick a uniform point in K. This is what we know about this problem. We can do it in N to the four iterations, where each iteration takes Mn time. All the algorithms are just Markov chains. Uh, 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 and, e, uh, and, we, and so I'm going to tell you how many steps of the chain and how much each, each step takes. Um, and then for uh, polytopes, uh, so th this, this is general, it works for any convex body. But for polytopes, Kanan and Narayanan in 2009 analyzed uh, what's called the Dickin walk, which uh, I think in this audience might be familiar to many because it's based on the Dickin ellipsoid defined by a convex uh, barrier function, in this case, just the logarithmic barrier. And then the number of iterations for a polytope with m facets is only mn. And the time per iteration is uh, mn to the, so this is matrix multiplication time, mn to the omega minus 1. Uh, last year, with the intent, we had an improvement on this. Uh, I'll, I'll brief, briefly mention it, where uh, the complexity goes down uh, below quadratic, which uh, so far seems to be a bottleneck for the other methods with the same per iteration time. And what I'll try to mention today 
is what we think is the right generalization of the previous approach, and it gives us a slightly better complexity. This is what we can prove. For all we know, there's no m, and, uh, uh, or n, I'll tell you in a minute, and the first step complexity is mn to the 1.38. Now, this is all in theory. In experiments, uh, that when I think he might even be doing them right now, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, 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 here's the comparison. Coordinate hit and run, which is an implementation of hit and run that seems to be comparable in, in, in performance and uh, faster uh, in per step complexity. Instead of mn, it's only m per step amortized. Uh, it takes about n squared steps. This Hamiltonian process that I'll describe in this talk seems to take a constant number of steps, and each step is solving a linear system, which basically takes the same amount of time right now. So, yeah, sampling might be down to the complexity of, uh, you know, polylogarithmic number of linear system solves if this becomes a theorem. But this is empirical, this part of it is. Okay, so uh, that's for sampling. One uh, noteworthy application of sampling is volume. And for volume, there's been a bunch of progress uh, using various techniques. Uh, so using the general, for the, in the general setting, volume or integration, you can do it in n to the four steps. These are the number of steps. Again, each step uh, in the general setting, of course, depends. It's just number of oracle calls. But when we talk about uh, polytopes, uh, again, each step is, is, uh, is going to be this matrix multiplication time. And the total complexity of computing the volume is down to mn to the 2 thirds. It's the same complexity as sampling. So this, as far as I know, is the first improvement for volume computation where using polytope structure lets you beat the, uh, uh, the general case. And you know, quite a bit. So that's, the, that's uh, sort of an application. So in this talk, uh, what I'd like to go over is the limitations of traveling on straight lines. Hamiltonian dynamics and this, and this walk that we can call the ham walk, convergence of this process, the role of isoperimetry in this convergence and what we can prove and not prove, and this, how, how we do volume uh, using this in this new setting, in this general setting. Uh, this, okay. So just to build up to this, uh, to this, to this, um, uh, to this process, uh, how do we sample? So we use random walks, as I mentioned. And the first one of the nice ones with a essentially complete analysis is the ball walk, which says uh, you're at a current point in the body. You uh, pick a uniform point in a little ball of fixed radius delta, so it's a parameter delta. If the point is in the body, you go there. Otherwise, you try again. So that's the process. Now, it's symmetric. You know, the probability of A to B is the same as B to A. It's just one over the volume of the ball. So the Station distribution is as we want. And now the question is how many steps? Each step is a membership, right? So if it were a polytope, it would take order mn. And so the theorem for, uh, for uh, convergence is that it's polynomial in the dimension, the diameter, and how, how close is the starting distribution to the target uniform distribution. In particular, let's say that this, this distance is a constant as measured as a ratio. Then the result of Kannan, Lovas, and Shimonovitz from 97 already says that uh, the, the number of steps you need is n squared d squared. Um, we can arrange d, this is for general bodies. For isotropic bodies, which means that uh, the, the covariance matrix is the identity, and the diameter might be n, but most of the body is in a ball of radius square root n, it's n to the 2.5. And for if, if the, if the kanan lovas schemers hyperplane conjecture is true, and I briefly mentioned this at the end, then the complexity would be n squared. So this is the status of the ball walk. Each step for a polytope would be mn. Now, there's a limitation. You could ask, uh, why are we, you know, n squared is, is order n squared. Can you do better? And the answer is no. I mean, so even in a hypercube, it can't mix any faster. Uh, and the reason is that the step sizes are severely limited. If you, if you try to make your step size any larger than what it is set to be, which is 1 over root n, then the probability of stepping out becomes too large. It just starts, it explodes exponentially. So you can't afford to make, scale up your step size. And therefore, because of diameter, you, you, have, to, you, you, take, you have this pro problem. Okay. Hit and run is the, the other process that's been analyzed and is practical. Uh, and in this one, 
has no parameter delta. At a point, you pick a random direction and the chord through it, and then a uniform point on that interval continues. So at every step, you're actually making a step. This is also symmetric. You know, the probability of go A to B, B to A, the density is the same. And so the station distribution is as we want. There is no rejection filter needed. But it has the same problem. You know, uh, this picture is misleading. What actually happens is that uh, the, the chords, if I, if I were to pick in my body a random point, it's very likely near the boundary, and then I pick a random chord, it's very likely going to be pretty short, about basically the length of the step that we were taking with the ball walk, 1 over root 10 on average. So it has basically the same limitation, even though you don't need to worry about these worst case issues of getting stuck suddenly. So in both cases, you have this n squared lower bound, and that is a lower bound. This process can't be any faster due to the boundary, even for a hypercube. Now this Dickin walk that I mentioned that uh, Kanan and Narayanan introduced or analyzed does the following. It says, why should I take the same uh, steps from the same ball each time or from the same distribution if I were doing hit, hit and run? I should adapt the local distribution according to where I am in the body. In particular, if I'm in the interior of the body, let's take a big ball. If I'm closer to the boundary, let's take a smaller ball. So the way they do it is, uh, you know, there's a matrix A, which is basically given by, determined by the, the slacks of the current point. Again, uh, I understand there have been reading groups on interior point methods, uh, but, but, but for a point, you're looking at how far every boundary is, and that's giving, defining an ellipsoid. And so this ellipsoid will be completely contained inside the body for no matter which point you are, but it will get smaller and smaller as you get closer to a boundary. So we pick uniformly from this ellipsoid and, 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 and uh, go there. Except you have to be careful, since these ellipsoids are no longer of the same volume, we, uh, to make the process to go to the right distribution, we have to apply a filtering step, a metropolis filter, which is basically the ratio of where you are to where you might go. Uh, that way you ensure the uniform distribution. So nice as it is, and this has one very nice property, which is that it's a fine invariant now. So origin scalings of the original body don't matter. You don't have to do any rounding. You might. Uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, you can't afford to make these ellipsoids too large because then the ratios of the volumes will go crazy. And you still need to keep them, keep them bounded. So that, that leads to this MN bound, even from a warm start. And the limitation, again, is this rejection probability. If you make them larger, you run into this issue. OK. Uh, now, in place of the Dickin um, walk, where the ellipsoid is defined by what's called the logarithmic barrier, uh, the, the, the Hessian of the logarithmic barrier. You could use other barriers. I mean, there's a whole theory of interior point methods. You could use other barriers. And in uh, some nice recent work, Chen, Vivedi, Wainwright, and you uh, considered, for example, the volumetric barrier by the interior point method. And they get, uh, it's still going to be quadratic for m equal to n, but they get, for example, one of the results is square root m times n to the 3 halves. And the first step complexity will, of course, go up depending on what interior point function you're computing. OK, so this is, this, this is uh, status here. So we go back and ask, you know, how does this actually happen in, uh, let's say, nature? You know, that would be Brownian motion. You know, um, yes, we want to make the step sizes larger, but let's do the opposite and make them infinitesimally small. So that would be Brownian motion. And of course, uh, and, and that's, that, that, you know, that's the heat equation, the way it dissipates. Um, but what do we do when we have boundaries? Right? We have to come up with something. This is, again, a whole field partial differential equations and studying these things. But uh, uh, you, know, people, you can reflect. You can uh, have other boundary conditions. Uh, if you do reflection, we run into very similar issues. Now, the, the idea would be, let's try to do Brownian motion and do reflection at the boundary. Uh, once again, you'll have to use very small step sizes when you discretize in order to maintain your target stationary distribution. Okay. So that doesn't quite work. The other option is just remove the boundary. Let's, let's get rid of the boundary. Well, what does that mean? We, we still want to have a distribution. So one way to do it is to use a barrier function. So let's describe this in more detail. So you can take a polytope and map it to what you might call a Hessian manifold. And what is that? Uh, instead of thinking of points, the distance between points, or the, the, the length of a point as just being the Euclidean length, um, there's a different metric at each point like the ellipsoids we had at each point, 
there's a different metric. It just measures the length according to the local ellipsoid. Well, why ellipsoid? Because it's going to be the Hessian of a convex function. That's why it's a Hessian model. So, so when I equip the space with such a, such a uh, convex function, and therefore a Hessian at every point, that's the, that's the Hessian manifold we're talking about. Okay, so each point has its own ellipsoid. Now, for a polytope, and, and this is the only uh, barrier function we'll use in this talk, uh, the standard barrier, uh, you could imagine the following situation. Here is the polytope, that's the function. So those are the level sets of the function. And then for each uh, boundary uh, hyperplane, there's a slack which measures the distance. So those are the slacks. And this function blows up, of course, as you get close to any one of them, and that's your, that's your uh, manifold. In this sense, we remove the boundary. So we will travel, we'll be traveling effectively on this. So you might, you can go forever, but on, in the real space, you're moving very slowly as you get closer to the boundary. Now, if you do have to be careful, if you did things uniformly here, then you'll spend most of your time near the boundaries, and we want to be uniform. So we'll have a, a deterministic field that pushes us away from the boundary. Instead of rejection, there'll be a deterministic field that pushes you away. So this is the process. Think of the continuous process first. It's Brownian motion, which would have been just this, plus drift, which is pushing you in a direction designed to make the for target, the, the, the stationary distribution uniform, or whatever it is that you want. Um, and each step is this Gaussian, infinitesimal Gaussian, but chosen according to the local metric. So whatever is your local metric, that tells you what the next Gaussian is. Okay, so that's this general process. Everywhere you have a little, little ellipsoid, you'll make a step according to that, but there's also a field that's pushing you away from the boundary. Uh, when uh, there is no determinism, I mean, no, no drift, and, uh, and uh, it's just uniform everywhere, that's the standard heat equation. And now, when we generalize with drift and general metric, can we get a faster method? So then, to do that, we have to choose what metric to use. And, and, and the drift, presumably, will be completely determined by the choice of star stationary distribution, but we still need to choose what metric. We get this big choice. The one we analyze is the metric defined by Hessian. In some sense, because it's, it's, it's worked well in optimization and uh, something we have some idea how to analyze. But it's an open question as to what's the best metric or how to choose the right metric. Um, so in this case, this, this, this differential equation becomes the following. Here is the Hessian to the minus half, and there's the drift. And the drift is completely determined by this also. Uh, uh, it looks like this, just by solving uh, the corresponding uh, uh, differential equation. And so here you have the Hessian inverse times the gradient of this, of the log, of the determinant of the Hessian. That's the, that's the drift. So the point is that you get an explicit equation for each, where you know what the, the differential equation is at each point. Now the question is, can we discretize this and get a faster method? And that's, that's what leads to this process called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. The Hamiltonian, in case, uh, like me, you don't remember it from physics, is this uh, really elegant way of expressing Newtonian mechanics that just says one function that expresses both your kinetic and potential energy, and motion is a, is a process that maintains this. Okay, the laws of motion are just maintaining this. So what are Hamiltonian dynamics? It's this Hamiltonian h, it's a pos function of position and velocity, and you get to um, uh, look at the, the, the change in the position is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the velocity, and the change in velocity is the negative of this. The point of setting up these equations this way is that when you move according to these, the quantity h is maintained, doesn't change. And so that's the Hamiltonian walk. At current point x, pick a random velocity. How do you pick the random velocity? According to the current distribution defined by x, according to the local metric. So a Gaussian with that covariance matrix. And then you move along the curve, no longer straight lines. These are curves defined by this Hamiltonian. Um, in the direction v, for some time delta or minus delta, just to symmetrize everything. So that's the process. Now this process uh, came up in practice first. I first learned about it at a Simon's workshop uh, we, uh, last uh, uh, May that co-organized. Uh, and uh, it's already being used in machine learning widely to sample models to take, uh, because other, other, other metropolis filter-based methods for non-convex problems were too slow in exploration. Um, the earliest uh, 
uh, or reference we know is Duane, Kennedy, Pendleton, and Rowe at 87, where they used it in, uh, to analyze some quantum mechanics. And then Neil in 96 started applying to various statistical infer inference problems, including sampling neural network models. And then this was extended to this general setting that I'm describing it in, where you have, you have different metrics at every position by uh, Girolami, Calderhead, and Chin. And there's many, many references. If you just Google Hamilton in Monte Carlo, you'll see it's used quite a bit. There were at least four talks in that workshop about, about this. OK, so this is the setup. So to sample, now let's say more generally, I want to sample according to this Gibbs distribution, you know, uh, exponential in some convex function. And I get to choose the metric g. So at each point x, g of x is this matrix. Then I set up this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian, if I run this process, is maintained. And then if I sample on the marginal for x, I get the right distribution e to the minus f of x. So these are all sort of lemma 1 and lemma 2 for this process. Well understood. That's why they use it in practice. Use this Hamiltonian, run it for a while, and then sample uh, uh, the marginal on x. So you pick according to the metric at the current distribution. And then uh, you move in the direction, uh, in, the, in the random direction v, either plus delta or minus delta with your differential equation. So, so you know, you have this drift term. That's what you're running. And now we're going to discretize this. We, that's the delta part of it. This is the, the equation that's telling you how to move. And the only discretization is how long we should move before we pick the random velocity again. The drift preserves this Hamiltonian, which you can think of as the total energy. The process is symmetric, and there's no filtering. There's no rejection probability at all. OK, so what uh, constraints the analysis? Why not just like one run one step? Um, things are changing, of course. Uh, the advantage is that rather than straight lines, which will hit boundaries quickly, uh, these things are going on curves which never hit the boundary, and in fact, the, this Hamiltonian preserving quantity curves around it, just goes and curve comes back, and you know, I'll show you a little picture. Um, what we can prove is that for a longer time than you could have done with previous walks, into the one-fourth time, the, you stay away from the boundaries. If you're at some distance from the boundary, it takes you that long to even halve your distance. So you're able to go quite a while before, before things get unstable, so to speak. Um, this is a... You might recognize this type of property is, in, is useful if you've worked in optimization. Um, if you could, for example, prove such a property for the central path defined by some objective function, a linear objective function, then you would get a faster max flow algorithm because this, the, the number of steps would be fewer. But of course, what we're doing here is for random directions, not for worst case directions. So convergence, we have some general theorems, which assume smoothness of the function and the metric and a Cheeger constant and tell you what the convergence rate will be. I won't put them up. For the log barrier in a polytope, this is the bound, mn to the two-third steps. For a hypercube, it's just uh, polylogarithmic. Uh, all the other previous methods take at least n steps, even for a hypercube. Of course, you know how to sample hypercube in, in log n steps anyway, but, but you can do it this way. Yeah. Uh, what is the, so one question is, what's the best metrics to use? I don't know. Um, then another question which we'll elaborate on in the remaining time is what's the corresponding uh, isoperimetric conjecture in this manifold setting? So what we can prove, and this is the core of how we get the sampling theorems. Yes? Does it make sense to ask the first question without uh, that is still computable? Yes, yes, exactly. That's why I put it in parentheses. Uh, you know, suppose I don't worry about one step computation complexity, still. It's interesting to know what's the optimal metric. And you didn't try the canonical one? Uh, I mean, uh, somebody told me, maybe you through internet, that uh, Einstein color is, uh, is a very good one. But uh, I, I don't yet know what it means to be optimal. Or, yeah, it would be nice to, or, or canonical, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think even for theoretical purposes, even knowing what's the rate without worrying about implementation would be interesting, yeah. Um, so here's the sort of uh, the core isoperimetry theorem that, that, that goes into this. I have, I have this polytope, and I've made a partition into three subsets. And there's a distance between any two points. 
Uh, but the distance is not Euclidean distance, it's the distance defined by the, by the metric, right? So there's a local metric, so you integrate along, along all curves and that gives you the minimum among all curves, that's your distance. Then what you can say is that for any alpha, you can think of alpha as one if you like, the integral of this S, S1 and S2 are separated by distance d. Then the integral of S3 is at least the smaller of S1 and S2 times the distance times square root alpha. Okay, this is optimal, this is the best, best you can prove for such a metric. Up to constant, it's optimal, that this just means there's a hidden constant. And, uh, and it's actually a, a, a special case of this is something previously known. Uh, if you take phi of x to be x squared, so it's like a Gaussian restricted to some polytope, and the distance to be Euclidean distance, then that's a known special case of the KLS conjecture when you have a Gaussian restricted to a polytope, and for that we know that this, this, this was already known. So if for this general setting, when we have, want to sample Gibbs distributions like this, uh, the, with, the, with the log barrier, you get this complexity. Um, when alpha is about one over m, that's uniform sampling essentially, that's why you get m n to the two thirds, but if alpha is higher, then actually it's faster. If you want to sample a more skewed distribution, it's much faster, and we'll take heavy advantage of that in the volume algorithm. Okay, so that's what it looks like in 2D. In, I do have to say how you, uh, very quickly, how it is that we actually implement, there is a running program, so <laughs> it, it, it can be implemented, but uh, you have to solve this, uh, this uh, differential equation at each step. How do we know that, uh, that you know, how do we solve this, to, uh, or how do we know that we can guarantee its solution quickly? Uh, the point is that these functions, this, the, the, the solution to this and the functions are smooth enough that in fact they can be approximated by low degree polynomials. And then in a previous paper, we showed that as long as the solution is low degree, we can find a good approximation uh, very quickly in essentially linear time the number of evaluations of the function without ever computing a derivative, which would involve a gradient, would involve a huge matrix and slow things down. So the running time is, uh, is uh, uh, nd times, d is the degree of the approximation, for us it's O tilde. Uh, that's, that's, that's what it takes to solve it. Okay, I, will, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna uh, very quickly just, uh, uh, so we can use this process now to get a faster algorithm for uh, volume. And uh, the volume algorithm is essentially the one from uh, work with uh, Ben Cousins, where we did it for standard volume, improved it to NQ for well-rounded bodies. But now we apply that algorithm in the setting of manifolds, uh, these Hessian manifolds. And uh, we're able to go at a rate that is determined by this self-concordance parameter which in the case of the log barrier is m, and uh, show that the total time is m n to the two third over epsilon squared over the, for the entire algorithm. Uh, I, I don't think I can do more than that, but let me conclude, this is the last slide. With this question, so the, the KLS conjecture in, says that if I take, say, a convex body, or in the case of polytope, if I take a polytope, and I look at uh, 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 the subset that minimizes its boundary compared to its volume, or that of its complement, so what's the minimum uh, Cheeger cut? You know, the, 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 the cut that minimizes the ratio of the boundary to the set or its complement. The conjecture says that it's within a constant factor of what you can get with a hyperplane. A hyperplane minimizes the, is the minimum up to a universal constant factor. You could ask, is something similar true, and I'm only saying question, not conjecture, is something similar true if instead of using Euclidean distance, we use distance according to a Hessian manifold in a polytope? And I, I, it should be false, it should be wildly false, but I don't know a counterexample. Yeah, I'll stop here. Is it obvious that the Amitonian Monte Carlo is a discretization of the diffusion and not a matter? Uh, 
Uh, uh, it's not obvious, but yes, it's, uh, it's true. Uh, um, uh, uh, the diffusion is uh, changing the, the drift at every point. It's, it's, it's imagine you're picking the direction in which you will move as well as the, at every point. Here, uh, we are keeping the, the direction the same for a while. Right. So depends how you mean discretization, but if I say time discretization with respect to ch when you change the, 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 the Gaussian, the, the random choice of direction, uh, then yes.